Hi, I'm Noam Wasserman, Dean of the Sai Sim School of Business at Yeshiva University. I was a longtime professor at Harvard Business School, an entrepreneur, and a venture capitalist. I wrote the bestseller, The Founder's Dilemmas. And I'm Charlie Harari. I've been working with companies for over 10 years. And that book, Founder's Dilemmas, and the challenges faced by the 10,000 founders in it is the basis of this podcast. We are delving into the issues faced by startups to help you avoid the pitfalls that claim so many good companies. Let's get started. Okay, everybody, welcome to the show. It is such an honor to be with you. Uh, we are launching a whole new podcast here, and we're doing this for a very specific reason. I've had the opportunity over the past uh, few years to really be able to spend time with uh, companies, with entrepreneurs, people that have started really wonderful businesses, uh, starting from scratch, build real companies. And one of the things that I've seen is there's a, there's a lot of knowledge from the school of hard knocks. And there's a lot of knowledge that you learn along the way. And there's no, you know, there's no teacher-like experience. But many times when you're running a company, when you're responsible for products, when you're responsible for people's you know, careers and lives, lots of entrepreneurs, and by the way, lots of CEOs now, I wouldn't even call them entrepreneurs, they're running real companies, kind of wish they had the information they would have learned, so to speak, in an academic setting research-based information. And it's hard to get it. It's hard to know it. They're not going to sit in a class. They're not going to go back to business school. And so we have this incredible opportunity now. Dean Wasserman, who is the dean of the Sai Sim School of Business, has really agreed to really share what he's learned through decades of research that can change the way an entrepreneur and a business owner thinks about their business. So to have the opportunity to sit one-on-one -on -one and really pepper questions and get underneath it is super exciting for me and Dean Wasserman. I want to thank you so much for agreeing to do this and and uh, and thanks for the time. And I'm so excited to jump in with you to this wild, wild world of entrepreneurship. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, Charlie. And first ground rule for us is please call me Noam. Uh, much prefer <laughs> I'll it. I'll try. <laughs> Um, I actually originally had been coming from that school of hard knocks that you were talking about. Uh, started life as an engineer, then added on business and did entrepreneurship for a while. Wow. Um, then, after getting my MBA, I had a couple of professors push me in the direction of getting my PhD and ended up taking a bunch of the things I had experienced and trying to put them in the light of data, being able to see how many of them recur for other people, how many of them really are the opposite patterns from some of the things that I had expected. And that's where we can tap a bunch of the things during our dialogue here about what does the data show? What does the word of mouth say? Where is there a divergence between the two that we can really learn things a lot better than having to go through the failure cycle and doing the hard knocks learning uh, that might come from that. Yeah. Um, some of the other things in terms of the entrepreneurial side is that there's actually a bunch of data that suggests that it is one of the most rewarding of the professions you can go into if you succeeded it. But unfortunately, as is some of the little data that's out there, uh, show, suggests that there's a very high rate of failure. How do you balance the two of those? How do you get the promise of entrepreneurship and the satisfaction it can bring, but also avoid the perils? And that's what's motivated me for the last 20 years. How can we identify the biggest perils? How can we be able to educate founders as they're heading into this journey about what those perils are and how to avoid them? Um, and in particular, there's a little bit of research that came out back in 1989, a close colleague of mine at Harvard, Bill Salman, had done this, of trying to understand of failures, what are the reasons for failure? And to me, there was a stunning result in it that really is a tiny part of that paper. It's like one line and one number in a table, but to me, it's the core of what we should be going on focusing on if we want to change the trajectory of our entrepreneurs. And what Bill found was that in contrast to the expectations that he had about what were going to be the reasons for failure, what today we would call product market fit issues or problems as the functions are all coalescing to go beyond a project team and now build a company and things like that. Bill actually found that there was one predominant reason for failure that blew away all the other ones. 65% of the reasons for failure were the people problems. I knew that. I, I, I don't know that. As you say it, 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 there's a wave of, you know, amen that's washing over me, but that I haven't, but that nobody really speaks about. Do you feel, do you find that? Like nobody will really walk you into an office and go, the problem is people. But yeah, the problem is the friction that I'm having with my co founder or the tensions between me and the hires that were brought in. No, that's going to be something going to sweep under the rug. And unfortunately, a lot of times those people problems are the hardest ones to undo. 
There are a bunch of other things in entrepreneurship where you can right. hit the undo key relatively easily right, when right. it comes to some product decisions or other things like that. The people problems, unfortunately, are among the hardest to be able to hit, the, you know, have the regret hit and then be able to say, how can I undo it? Sometimes it means I have to go to a clean slate right. rather than being able to, to reverse the, the gears that I had. So there's so many things that I, I want to jump into, but I think those that are listening, like this is a huge to me, just a huge concept for everyone to sort of digest, which is so many of our problems really are the, are, are the things that we have the hardest time dealing with, with really rich people, right? And what is considered to be soft, if you will, is really critical and necessary. But one of the things that I want to, du- du- I want to double down on with you here, and why to me this podcast is so critical, is there is a sense of, I know better than the data. There is a sense of, come on, like, I've been living it. And it's I think it's I think it's a pump fake. And I think that people get lured into the I've been doing it for two, five, ten, twenty years. And at least from what I've seen in the the CEOs and the companies that I've seen or been involved in, the difference between those that really do make it and that pivot and that grow really aligns with what you said earlier, which is a respect for data, a respect for learning, and a respect for knowledge. Now, we lived in a world where we've met, I've met people, I'm sure you've met people that have come to this country that can barely read and write and with the, their will and their force, they've built companies. On the, and those are, I think, I think those are the exceptions. I think the rule is if you're running a company, if you're responsible for a division and you're not willing to spend the time to look at data, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage, even though it feels like you know what you're doing because you don't know anything else. I think that, do you feel that? Do you find that with entrepreneurs that you've dealt with? No, absolutely. I think there's multiple levels of what you're getting at there. There is a bit of the entrepreneurial mindset that is, you can't learn it except by failing right. and being able right. to right. reflect on that and then do it better the next time around. Yes. And we don't say to the chemist, go into the lab, mix a few chemicals, and learn which ones explode. <laughs> right, right. We have some knowledge right. about chemistry that we teach them first, and then that arms them to do better things in the lab because now they've been able to take everything we've been able to learn, and they'll now be able to go beyond it by going and applying the things that they have been able to get under their belt. Same thing with entrepreneurs. There are all sorts of things that we have learned about the problems that you're going to cause for yourself that we can help you avoid to begin with. There's all sorts of ways in which by having an idea of actually two levels of roadmaps. There's actually in a couple of the other things that you were talking about. There's ways in which we can see that it's critical at two levels for the entrepreneur to be able to be in touch with things. And from a Jewish perspective, we can see it as a couple of the things that are very classically uh, things that the rabbis talk about. There's first the Ben Adam Atzmo being able to have within your own head, being in touch with you, your capabilities, your strengths, your weaknesses, your biases. And a recurring theme across the problems that founders cause for themselves is that there's very natural human biases that we succumb to. Right. That skew right. our decisions, the right. uh, overconfidence that we bring to it, the passion that we bring to it, things right. that we celebrate as being a strength of the founders that actually turn out to be perils. Right. And we'll be able to delve into a bunch of those things when That's it comes a critical to area. your own head. Yeah. And being able to get the self-reflection going, being able to have a lot better of an understanding of the natural human inclinations that we have to be able to identify and be able to work yeah. against, that's one of the levels. Yeah. And then the second level is the Ben Adam Le Chabero, the How things that we talked with, right. about, the interpersonal, the relationships, the relationships yeah. and other pieces yeah. like that. Yeah. And that's what if we can educate people before they dive into the yeah. difficult task of yeah. taking the weight of the world on their own shoulders to create something from scratch, they're going to be much Major. better suited to be able to succeed within that realm. The, and, and I think you're 100% right. It's funny, I was on the phone yesterday with, a, with, a, with an entrepreneur who, who runs a pretty large business. And we were having a conversation last night. He, we were talking about getting rid of an employee. And in the middle of the conversation, he's a, he, he's a really nice guy, right? And someone did the wrong thing, a, termin, a terminable offense, if, I, if that, that's the right use of words, mm-hmm. right? And he delayed, and it didn't really do it, and then it got a little worse, right? And then the guy stayed, and now it, it's blowing up, blowing up. So we were on the phone last night, and I said to him, one of the things that I've learned, again, I'm not an expert, you're more of an expert than I am in this, but one of the things that I've learned is that the, the role of a leader in business and, and people are not going to know this, but you're, you just said it, and I want to I wanna now take each of your points and delve into it, right? Ben Adam la Atmo, between man and himself, between person and themselves. And I said to him, I said, you know, you have to 
be honest with yourself. Did you not fire that employee who did the wrong thing, hurt other people, almost blew up the business, and really was on notice because you're a nice guy or because you're non-confrontational? And it's very different, right? Being a nice guy is amazing. And if you're really a sweet, nice guy and it's mercy that's driving this, that's one path we have to deal with. What's the right thing? But if the reason why you didn't do it is because you're non-confrontational or because you need the guy. If you don't have that self-awareness, if you're not working on yourself, if you don't have what you what you're laying out now, which is the beginning of this roadmap, which, you know, for those that are listening, I'm hoping that you're already taking notes, right? Where you're, you're beginning to lay out the how we do this, the respect for data and learning, the understanding that there's two paradigms that you're working on all the time as a leader, right? You're working on yourself and you're working in relationship with others. And in my conversation last night, I, I, I tried to impress upon him that his, his financial abilities are wonderful. But if he doesn't have self-awareness, it's going to be hard to lead. He's, he's not going to have to make his decisions, which I think is what you're getting at. Yeah, no, you're getting into another one of the fundamental human biases that cause problems for us as founders, and that is that natural inclination to avoid difficult issues. And one of the key things I have to drill into my students and give them exercises to do it and uh, be able to have ways in which we can counter that bias is around building difficult conversation muscles. This is applicable if you are founding with someone. This is applicable if you are co-founding your life with your spouse, being able to build the difficult mm -hmm. conversation muscles. This is something that just we as humans are not good at, and that if we go and run the other direction from these problems, um, then it's going to cause even further problems. The little elephant in the room is going to grow and become far bigger and cause a problem there. You also have a beautiful microcosm that you were just talking about. Um, there is a line in Silicon Valley that gives a little bit of guidance around the hiring issues that you face. It is fire slow, uh, hire slow, fire fast. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that we do exactly the opposite of that because of these natural problems that we yes. face, that we will go and rush into the hiring and we will slow down when it comes to the firing, yeah. even though everyone hears that phrase and yet the human biases lead us to go and conflict with both halves of it. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right. I and mean, people, I, I've seen that, yeah, I think you're, you're right on in how we deal with people and how we try to bring them in quickly to solve pain problem, pain points that really, without, without putting them in the right positions and then and ultimately fire slow. So I, I wanna sort of jump in and you, you had mentioned, um, you know, we spoke a little bit about this and for those that are listening, we're gonna circle back. So stick with us throughout this series. But let's sort of start from the beginning, right? Let's start, you know, in your mind, let's go all the way back to, as they say in, in, in Jewish, bracious, right? To, the, to Genesis for those that are, that are tapping in now. Um, a company begins with an idea, right? So take us through the process of an individual, even before he's in the world of relationships, right? He, you know, an individual comes to this world alone before they connect. And an entrepreneur usually comes at it alone. Sometimes like they may be co-founders, but start from the beginning with us. How does a person start to understand when he has an idea, when that morphs? when he needs a co like co-founding, like take us all the way to the beginning. And by the way, if you're listening and you're already halfway through, it's worth it to go back and see how it's supposed to be because you may need to reverse engineer bits of, bits of this. And so even if you're saying, hey, whoa, I already have 150 employees, l listen, listen, listen to the beginning the way the Dean says so, because I think that it'll, it'll provide insights along the way. Yeah, no, and even deeper in terms of the importance of going back, even if you're in the middle of the fray, is a lot of times the seeds that you planted early on aren't going to become evident later on, until later on, when it comes to the issues that they're going to be creating. And so there might be some of the things that we'll be talking about as the pitfalls that you did do yourself, but it's not going to be until after right now that you're going to finally see the repercussions of it. And there might be some ways to be able to head off at the pass exactly. if you can be able to tune into that. Um, but one of the things that uh, a little bit of the assumption that you're making was that uh, when you get the idea, that's when founding starts. A bunch of the critical things that you're doing are actually even before hmm. founding, okay. even before the idea comes to you. You're building your foundation of what's going to become your platform for your skills, your contacts, all the things that go into being able to found well. And so a lot of the most important things are going on even during the pre-founding part. Huh. The uh, career that you are building on the way to it, if you know that, say, five years from now, you are going to want to found, 
go and think down the road to it, skate where the puck is going to be, and think through what are the all the, what's the checklist of all the things I'm going to have to do well mm-hmm. in order to be able to increase the chances that I'm going to be able to found well. Mm-hmm. And almost always there are going to be some gaping holes. Mm-hmm. If you are waiting until the last minute to decide how to fill those holes, you're going to be remaining with some unchecked boxes on that checklist. But if you have five years or even two years worth of a warning, you can work on the way to it. Right. If there's going to be a critical skill you're missing, I am really good at technology, but I don't know anything about sales. And you are stuck at the last minute having to fill that sales hole. That's not going to go well. Mm-hmm. If you have a couple of years worth, you could go and try to find a job in sales, be able to learn on someone else's tab, be able to learn the best practices, maintain your strength on the tech side, but then be able to also check off your box within there. That's one of the ways you can fill in some of the unchecked boxes. Other ones are by networking, being able to find and meet people who are going to be your complements within the team. Uh, One of the things we'll get into later on in the podcast is going to be things around Azir Connecto, being able to find the complementary piece that is going to be able to fill in the holes and a bunch of the interpersonal challenges that Azir Connecto is going to be introducing. But um, the ways in which over time to build your network is Mm -hmm. also going to take forethought. And if you're waiting until the last minute to go and start saying, where can I meet these people who are going to be able to help me tomorrow, then there's going to be all sorts of problems with being able to fill that in. It's interesting you say that because I think there's really two, there's a few people that, that, that I think they fall into a category of worrying about something that you're, you're basically saying not to worry about. So students and people that are a little younger in their careers sometimes are sitting in jobs they don't want to be in, worrying about leaving those jobs. And I, what I'm hearing you say is, whoa, whoa relax. You're, 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 you're founding. You're pre-founding. Like that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a frame that I think if people understood better, it would change how they approach what they have in front of them. I have a friend of mine who's a partner at a big law firm. And he says to me all the time, he says, we hire people in our law firm knowing that 90% won't make it. But what, what bothers me, he says, is that the lawyers that are there for the two, three, four, five years that are there, if they would just see it as a learning opportunity and go all in, when they leave and go into the business of it, they go in, in-house, they'll be so much better, but they don't. As soon as they hit that challenge of, I don't want to do this, it, they're, 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 they're checked out. And I think what you're saying is so critical for those people that are moving there or want to go into either either into new industries or into, into in the idea of, of being a founder. And as opposed to seeing it as I'm getting an education in the real world, They're, they don't look at it like that. And so they may rush into it without the level of, of education that the world is, is willing to give them and pay for it. Right? When you're working in someone else's company doing something, they're paying you to do a job. You're getting paid to get an education if you just see it that way. And I think it would change how a lot of people look at their trajectory of ultimately going off on their own or joining with other people and starting something that's a little more entrepreneurial than what they have right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Being able to see everything as a learning opportunity is a critical part of that mindset. But another thing is not just defaulting to it and telling yourself, justifying the time you're spending in that law firm is saying, okay, I'll pick up things along the way. Bringing more intentionality to it is one yeah. of the key things. Yeah. Being able to have some idea what is the target I'm shooting at, whether it's founding or not, but having some kind of an idea of the equivalent of that checklist that we were just talking about. What am I missing that I would be able to have a little bit of, if I can direct the law firm that on this next project, I want to do something that I haven't done before, but that might set me up for something in the future. You can take a little bit more of the reins in terms of being able to manage your career, of being able to work towards that five-year goal, whatever it is, rather than just leaving it to the happenstance of they're assigning me on this project as something, and I'm not sure whether it's going to be productive and setting me up for anything, whether it's going to be redundant. Um, so being able to take intentionality and being able to bring some planning to it um, is going to be a lot more productive along the way as you're being able to learn how to be able to take all of these lessons and incorporate them into my future. Yeah. And so, so they the idea is that even before we get into the world of founding, um, there is there is some level of respect for a pre-founding phase that people at any point need to learn. Right? I have a friend of mine who was running a company um, that, that that hit that hit a significant wall, and what he did to his credit, I mean, he was running a very successful company. It hit a little bit of a wall, and he wanted to learn a new industry, so he was you know uh, he humbled himself. And then got involved in something in which he wasn't, you know, at the top. But he understood because he is this. This person happens to be a serial entrepreneur. He he understood that it, to this point that, that I can shift and learn. I can. My career is is complex to the point in which there's pre-founding moments. And we're, we're, what I want to sort of drive towards here is that pre-founding doesn't mean you're in college, and it doesn't mean you go back to school. Right? Pre-founding can happen at any point. 
Because even within a company, there's divisions and there's new learnings and there's pivots. That really is a founding of what of sorts. If someone's willing to see what they're doing really as needing a pre-founding base. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's multiple levels of what you're trying to do during that pre-founding. Some of it is the learning about yourself, mm -hmm. the roadmap of myself. Mm -hmm. Some of it is the learning of the journey that I might be going on, the roadmap of uh, whether it's going to be the founding journey or not, mm -hmm. and then projecting yourself into that roadmap. And then along the way, building a lot of the life skills that are going to be critical no matter what that is going to, the direction that you're going to go in. So for instance, the learning skills that you were just talking about, that is a muscle that we can build. Being able to say, uh, building in time for reflection, being able to ha get better at being able to derive lessons out of every of the step along the way, especially the missteps along the way. Um, building the difficult conversation muscles that we had talked about before. Um, ways in which that's going to apply to any walk of life, whether it's professional or personal. Um, ways in which you're learning about yourself along the way of, these are the types of things that I am going to be really good at, and these are the things I should find someone who can fill in my holes. That's a critical thing that early on, we especially if we're going to be a passionate founder thinking, I can go and conquer the world. Um, being able to get a lot more of a picture of ourselves and the strengths and weaknesses are a key piece of it. Going back to one of the other things you were talking about that also misleads us that we also have to grapple with a little bit is we all hear about the outliers. We all hear about the ones who succeeded smashingly and see a hallowed picture of how they were able to get to there. And we think that they are the rule rather than the exception. Mm -hmm. And we think that we can be another one, the next Bill Gates, the next Mark Zuckerberg, the next ones are, who are going to be the next Anita Roddick, who's going to be able to succeed at being able to change an industry and be able to understand that those outliers, even they had to surmount a bunch of challenges that if they n had not done that, we would not have heard their names. And how can we be able to stack the deck in our favor of being able to see what are the lessons we can learn and be able to have ways that we can anticipate a lot better than the typical founder who is known for the high rate of failure. Mm -hmm. So if you had to um, maybe just categorize for those that are just sort of putting it, that are listening here, what, what would be sort of three or four of the top um, categories that would be considered uh, that which one should focus on in the pre-founding phase? Like what are some of the things that somebody who says, okay, because to, to recognize a pre-founding phase really, it's, it's always. So how should somebody categorize it? How, what, what can they do to say, okay, in the pre-founding phase, I want to make sure I'm doing one, two, three, four, and five. How, how, would you, how would you create something that I can write down on a piece of paper and follow? So the way they tend to think about that decision about is it for me, when should I start, and things like that, um, I find that there are three arenas that okay. founders typically have to be thinking about. Okay, good. And they usually focus on just one of them and neglect the others, and that's at their peril. Okay, good. The first of them is the business circumstances. So they will focus this idea, is there a way in which it might have a market and being able to do a bunch of that testing. There's a whole religion around lean startup and how mm -hmm. do you do product testing that's grown up over the last 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, that is the one that whenever I ask founders, how are you thinking about this decision, whether to found or not, that's the one they start off with. There's two other places that, uh, that they should think a little bit more about as they're heading into this. The second of them is the circumstances around their career readiness. So have I built at at least three levels, the ways in which I'm gonna be prepared uh, for this. First of them is just on the skills side that we've been talking about. Another one, so we call that within academia, that's the human capital that you've built. Um, then there's the social capital. Have I been able to build the network, the contacts, the uh, ways in which I'm gonna be able to find the people that I need uh, who are gonna be able to fill my holes. There's actually a major human bias in that realm that works against us. Um, in academia, it's called homophily. Homophily means birds of a feather flocking together. We all have a natural inclination to be a lot more comfortable with those who are just like us. Uh, people who have, share a background with us, whether it's uh, that we all came up through business school, we all came up through technical school, we have other things that are going to be the sharing of that. Uh, we all come from a similar geography. We all come from you know, a lot of other things that are the basis of socially who we feel very comfortable with. The problem is that that means that when you find one of those people, they're not going to be filling your holes. They're going to be doubling down on your strengths. Right. So from the checklist perspective, they're going to be double checking a box rather than taking an unchecked box and checking it off for you. And that has several things that are going to be introduced as problems. When you have a double checked box and an unchecked box, that means A, you're going to be missing a key hole because you haven't checked off that box. But B, you're going to be heightening the tensions within the team because both of you are going to be wanting to make the decisions that are in your sweet spot. And you're not always going to agree on it. 
And so the double check box has its own challenges uh, that you're going to be introducing there. Uh, but being able to have the ways in which you're going to be able to grow your network, the social capital side of meeting those different from me. Um, if I'm a business person, how can I find the technologist? Do you even know where they hang out? Do you even know the language that they talk? So you'd be able to converse with them, be able to see whether this person might be good for me. Or even if it's not a tech company, if you are someone who does non-sales part of business, do you even know how to be able to interview a salesperson to be able to tell whether they're going to be a good co-founder to be able to fill in your hole? Um, even the worst salespeople are great at interviewing. <laughs> they're able to have all sorts of ways yeah. that they can sell themselves that you're not going to be able to understand how to be able to see through it and be able to tell whether they're going to be very good at it. Um, the final one of the capitals that we could talk about in addition to human capital and social capital is the financial capital. And this is also related to the third of the key circumstances that you have to be thinking about. So in addition to the business circumstances, the career circumstances, there's the personal circumstances. So <clears throat> if I have saved up a whole bunch of money where this dangerous, risky thing that I am doing of founding, that's going to take twice as long, require twice as much money as I anticipated, have I built that cushion for myself? that I'm going to be able to go through the uncertainties of founding. And especially if I have a family that's going to be dependent on me, if I have all sorts of other things that's going on in my personal life, yeah. if I have not prepared well for the personal side of it, I've neglected that because I'm so focused on the business circumstances, then that's going to be very dangerous for a lot of the things that yeah. are the most valuable for me. And so pre-founding, you have to be able to evaluate all of those pieces of it, do it proactively so that hopefully over time, you're going to be able to converge on a better solution. If you are missing the personal, you can work on that over time to be able to save more money, uh, live the life of a founder financially, you know, the, the slim belt, you know, the, the all sorts of ways in which you can take your extra money and sock it away so that you can be able to create that cushion that you wouldn't have otherwise, be able to give the family a little more of the security of it. Career-wise, we already talked about how to be able to fill in your holes if you're doing it proactively, doing it with a couple years worth of uh, warning about what are the things I don't have right now that I should be going through. And then over time, not rushing through the business evaluation. Um, this is actually going back to one of the key uh, biases that we talked about before, passion. Passion is something that founders think is the key magic that they bring to the table, the way in which I can convince someone that this is the future of it. But if you think about all of these circumstances that we've been talking about, passion actually becomes a peril. Hmm. When you think this is a product I would really want, there must be a vast market out there when you're looking at the business circumstances, then passion is actually going to cloud your judgment about whether this really is a good idea or not. When it comes to the career circumstances, there's all sorts of ways you're going to overstate right. what your capabilities are, your ability to handle the unknown. And you don't even know what a lot of those capabilities are going to be that's going to be needed when you found. Yeah. And being able to overestimate the ways in which your passion is going to convince your significant other that, yes, you should support me throughout this because it's going to be glorious with all my passion for this idea. Yeah. We're going to be able to conquer the world. When that money starts coming rolling in, we're not going to have to worry about the financial risks and things like that. Being able to see the downsides of the passion, being able to bring well, one of my favorite quotes from dear departed Steve Jobs, Allah Shalom, is follow your heart, but check it with your head. Very good. I, I, there's so much here. Um, as you're talking, I'm thinking passion's a peril, but I would, as you're saying, I would think that purpose is a, pe is a peril too, because you take passion and you put it with purpose and it becomes a whole different like, um, but the, we're, we're going to, we're going to continue to delve into this in, in future episodes. There's so much, there's so much here in what you just laid out as, as a framework for us to delve into. And maybe in the next few episodes, for those that are sticking with us, we'll go down and, and really drill into human capital and social capital, and financial capital. So this is a way to, at, at any point in one's life regardless of how you're making your moves, whether it's starting a company from scratch, whether it's shifting, whether it's um, building new divisions, whatever it is, it, it all plays with the same way of thinking. Just taking a look at a few of the takeaways that uh, emerged from this episode. Uh, first off, founders tend to focus on the product and financing, uh, give a lot of their attention to it, give a lot of the, uh, the focus and the time that they spend on it. However, you neglect people at your peril. Uh, we took a look at how 65% uh, of the reasons for failure are not product, are not the financing. It's actually the people side. Um, and there's actually two sides to that that are very interlocking with each other. First, there's the interpersonal, what in Hebrew we refer to as the Ben Adam Chavero, that has to be built on a foundation of self-awareness, the Ben Adam Atzmo. And lacking the self-awareness, you're not going to be very good at being able to do the interpersonal. And yet, that's going to be heightening the chances that you're going to have problems within the team. 
If you know that you might want to found in the future, use the luxury of time and forethought to proactively identify your holes and your risks. Uh, use your pre-founding time to fill in those holes by having a very concrete way um, that you're going to be able to use the unchecked boxes on your checklist and be able to fill in your holes, whether it's the skills, the contacts, or even the financial amount that you're going to be able to sock away. Um, a major factor that will interfere with the good preparation, uh, being able to think clearly about it, is something that is actually what you think of as a source of your magic as a founder and that everyone will agree to it, that your passion for the idea and for founding is a critical thing. However, that passion will cloud your evaluation of your weaknesses when it comes to the business circumstances, your career circumstances, and your personal circumstances. Passion holds a lot of promise, but it also comes with perils. Appreciate that and find the ways that we talked about in this episode for being able to think a little bit more clearly about being able to tell where you have holes and where you have to fill them in. Dean, thanks so much for, uh, for, for, for launching this. And I'm excited to keep on going. And I, and I hope that there, our listeners are, um, are seeing just how much wisdom that you have that you're going to be sharing with them in the next, uh, in the, in the next bit. No, thank you for helping found the podcast. <laughs> and also one of the key things for people to keep in mind, uh, Rashi talks about as the Israel are heading to Matan Torah, to the giving of the Torah, um, that kolhat chalot kashot, like all of the beginnings are difficult. All of the foundings in life are going to come with all sorts of problems with it. But if you can understand a lot better the challenges you're going to face, he says, then it becomes sweet for you. Then it's going to be able to turn into a lot more of that Beautiful. satisfaction that we started off with. Very true. For those who are listening and you want to send us a question, a thought, an idea, foundersdilemmaspodcast at gmail.com, foundersdilemmaspodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love your feedback, your thoughts, and your questions. Thanks so much for listening, and we can't wait to speak to you next time. Thank you.